actually. So Luke Burgess, thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Sean. Really good to be here. So we're going to talk today about something called mimetic desire. Uh, and just before we were recording, I explained that I first discovered this theory through your work uh, on Chris Williamson's Modern Wisdom podcast. And there I was on a walk maybe seven or eight months ago. Um, and I was walking in a woods and I just picked a random episode for nothing of it. And that was going to be the, the podcast that kept me company kind of idly as I walked. And 20 minutes into the walk, I literally stopped and I tweeted and I'm like, this has blown my mind. This whole theory has changed the way I see the world in no more than maybe 30 minutes, right? I had a very uh, brief introduction into the theory and I'm like, Christ, this is crazy. But I have to be honest, before I heard that episode, I had no idea what mimetic desire was. I didn't even know what the word mimetic meant. So maybe for listeners, we can start there. What is mimetic desire? Oh man, I wish it would have taken me 30 minutes um, to, to have my world change. It took me, it took me quite a while and it, it was somewhat painful. Um, you know, when it was my, my 20s in my startup entrepreneurship days, um, not understanding why I was pursuing goals uh, with great passion only to become very disillusioned a short time later. And I couldn't quite put my finger on what was going on. And I knew that there was something about the nature of desire, about the way that I wanted things that I didn't understand. And went through a real crisis in my late 20s and stepped away from running my company for a while and was introduced to this thinker named Rene Girard, whose core idea is this idea of mimetic desire. And it's simply the idea that human beings imitate the desires of other people from essentially from you know, the, t the earliest age without really knowing that we're doing it. So we tend to think of human desire as something that we just generate out of ourselves. You know, we want what we want and we don't often question why we want the things that we want. Gerard's idea is that human beings are social creatures and we learn to want things by taking our cues from other people. Uh, you know, babies are looking into their mother's eyes and paying attention to what their mother seems to want as soon as they're born. And we carry that with us into adult life, but we normally don't think of ourselves as imitating other people at the level of desire, right? We, we know that we imitate language and fashion sometimes, if we're honest and certain trends, but we don't often think of our imitation being at the level of desire. And that was Girard's fundamental insight. So the word mimetic is a word that means imitative. It comes from the Greek word that means to imitate. So mimetic desire is imitative desire. And the reason he coined the phrase mimetic desire and didn't just call it imitative desire is because mimetic carries with it a slightly negative connotation in that it's a hidden form of desire. It's the kind of desire that we don't really like to admit. We kind of hide it because as we become adults, we like to think of ourselves as very independent. Nobody needs to show me what to want, right? Um, what I want is completely unique. But Gerard's point is that we, we are social and our desires are in fact shaped by people who model desires to us. And so this is interesting, right? Because Rene Girard is somebody who I'm now aware of through your work and following you and you share lots of examples of mimetic desire out in the wild. Uh, and I've kind of picked up through osmosis of your tweets that Rene Girard has become somewhat of a a recent hero in the tech bro community, right? Everybody seems to be talking about him. Everybody seems to be latching onto his work as if it's the most recent discovery that we have ever come across. But his work has been around for decades, right? So how did he first come across this theory and why do you think it's so relevant and so prevalent right now? That's the irony is that Gerard himself has become a bit mimetic. His ideas have become mimetic. Um, the desire to know Girard um, is spread through mimetic desire, right? So desire is sort of spread by contagion. Um, I think he would laugh if he was still around. He died in 2015. So he, um, he, he died shortly before his, his ideas became as popular as they are right now. Um, so Girard was, was a Frenchman who left France shortly after World War II and came to the States and bounced around to different universities and is well known for spending the last part of his career at Stanford, where he had some very famous students, uh, like the co-founder of PayPal, Peter Thiel, was one of his students. And 
he, he was sort of an interdisciplinary mind, right? We, we, many sort of academics these days are very siloed. They teach one thing. They do it really well. Gerard was getting his hands into everything. So he was studying history, literature, um, you know, he was looking at archaeology, um, and he sort of began to see these patterns emerging in the way that people wanted things, um, specifically in, in the literature that he was reading. He made this recognition that in many of the great works of literature, uh, the, at least the Western classics, the characters in these books never want anything spontaneously. They if you pay really close attention, you will always find another character in the story who is modeling a desire for the person. So classic example of this would be my favorite work of fiction of all time, Don Quixote um, by Cervantes. You, know, you have this guy who's reading this book about these valiant knights and all of a sudden just gets the idea that he has to become one, right? And he gets the desire, he wants to become a knight, and he spends the rest of the book going on these missions, these valiant missions, and all of them are, he's sort of uh, being, uh, it's almost like there's some puppeteer in the story that's that, like they're constantly making him chase these different things, right? And he doesn't realize it. Gerard saw that this happens in, in all great literature. And in fact, great literature is great because it's a reflection of life. It's a reflection of some truth about human life and human desire. And that's why it's, it feels so real to us. So he started with literature. He had this insight. He saw something that even the great literary theorists didn't see, probably because they were just you know, too close to the work and so buried in their theories. He was coming to it with fresh eyes. And then he explored history. He explored, um, he, he was fascinated by science. And everything sort of validated this idea for him that humans, um, the, the very nature of desire is mediated to us by, by other people. Now, that doesn't mean that if I'm hungry, I don't know that I want food because there, there is some level of, uh, I would even call it needs, right? Where my, I have bodily instincts that show me what it is that I want, right? So if I'm thirsty, I want water. If I'm hungry, I want food. But after those things, right? Once we've sort of satisfied those basic needs, how do we know what to want? We don't have any kind of internal instinctual radar that would help us choose between one object or another. So his really powerful insight is that, well, how do we choose between one object and another? It's almost always by looking around and finding people who model the desire for things to us in some way. And then very often we sort of rationalize it after the fact, and we find these very rational reasons why we chose one thing or the other. And we don't acknowledge the role that the model of desire played. Are the things that we want um, converging closer and closer together as the world becomes more connected, right? So I spoke a few weeks back with John Yates, the author of a book called Fractured, and his whole work is around the idea that as the common life has faded away, we as a society have become less and less connected. And yet, as we have become more connected online, our models of desire, correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps when René Girard was born and we may have had the ability to model what we saw in our village or model what we saw in the newspaper. Um, and therefore, there would be kind of distinct buckets of desire separated by who we could model. As we now all look to the, I don't know, Kendall Jenners of the world, does that mean that everybody now desires the same thing in a way different to perhaps when Rene Girard was first born? Well, certainly we have a greater array of models of desire than ever before. Um, I'm of the age, I'm 40, so I grew up really without social media as a kid, right? Um, didn't get Facebook until I was in college. But I remember distinctly how destabilizing that was to any sort of sense of self. I mean, it's one way to describe the modern world is it's highly destabilizing to the sense of self. It was even before Facebook, but now I go on any social media platform and I'm surrounded by thousands of people who are modeling desires for different things. And if we don't realize that these people that we're seeing on Instagram and Facebook and, and Twitter and all these different platforms... They're more than just giving hot takes. Um, it's more than just sharing ideas and pictures. 
they're affecting us somehow at the level of desire. So in a sense, I don't know if it's necessarily making us want the same things and making our desires converge on the same things. I think it's making um, our desires like highly um, schizophrenic and, and, and volatile. And it's sort of, it's why subcultures form, right? And there's like millions, literally millions of subcultures online that you can join. And the easiest definition of some of those are just like people who have the same models and sort of some of the same desires. And then you have people that drift between them because, you know, there might be a more powerful model of desire comes along for something else. So I think if we don't realize that desire is mimetic, it's difficult to understand the online world for what it is, which for me is a sea of mimetic desires and a universe of more models than we can ever really wrap our heads around. And very few people are intentional about who they're allowing to influence them at the level of desire. You know, we follow people indiscriminately without necessarily asking ourselves the basic question, you know, how does what this person want, might, how, how might that affect what I want? And then five, ten years later, we find ourselves with different ideas and different desires and maybe with some new car that we didn't really need or want um, before we saw the guy on Twitter talking about his new Tesla every day to us. And, you know, I see that in myself even, right, being affected at the level of desire from social media. So this is an interesting point to bring this in because um, you say something at the beginning of the book and you put it far more eloquently than I'm about to because I'm paraphrasing, but you essentially say that mimetic desire is one of those things that comes along in our lives that um, there's almost a paradigm shift, right? You live two different lives, one before you're aware of it and one immediately afterwards. And once you know about this theory, um, not only does it explain so much, but there's no going back. You can't not see it in everyday life, in everything you do. Um, so how did you first come across this? What was your kind of gateway drug into seeing the world differently? So I had this real existential crisis where I wasn't satisfied with running my own company. And I had everything that I thought that I wanted. And I realized, well, something's wrong here. Um, there's this never satisfied striving that I'm doing. And it's sort of making me miserable. So I need to, need to figure this out. Um, and I stepped away. Uh, dove and I just took like a mini sabbatical. I traveled, I read a lot. And one of the things that I did was I went on a silent retreat and there was a retreat director there who I didn't know at the time was very familiar with the work of Rene Girard. And, you know, we would meet every day and I would sort of talk about, you know, some of the things that I was thinking about, some of the desires that I had that were bubbling up to the surface I started to have this recognition that I'd started my company for all the wrong reasons, that I didn't actually like the business that I was in. I just sort of, you know, liked the idea of building a company and selling it and all those things. And I realized that I needed to sort of step away until I figured out something that was going to be a more sustainable long-term desire for me. And without, without using the words mimetic desire or models of desire, he just sort of very gently uh, encouraged me to explore the influences in my life going all the way back to the very beginning uh, from friends, teachers, uh, news, everything. And I sort of took this inventory, did this history and came to realize how I had been affected. And as we were sort of leaving, he, um, he'd give, he gave me some reading materials and some homework. And uh, a couple of those books were books by Rene Girard. So I went home, uh, I read them, and I thought to myself, wow, like, I, I, I had mixed feelings, right? It didn't, it didn't all sort of hit me right away. I was a little skeptical. I was like, could it really be that, you know, imitation plays this big of a role in my life? There was something about that that I didn't really like, you know? And little by little, I started seeing how mimetic the world around me was. And I sort of call that my oh shit moment where I could sort of see, you know, the way that people would just like latch on to trends and like, you know, crypto today would be like a, a good example, right? Um, and how quickly things would be adopted only to be sort of discarded a short time later. And I was like, wow, yeah, maybe there's something to this. And then I had what I call my holy shit moment 
which was where I started to sort of really begin to see it in myself and see, I don't know, there was like, um, I, I learned to have like a, uh, to add sort of a, a beat to my decision makings. And it was like the beat between stimulus and response where I could actually step back and ask myself, honestly, what was attracting me to a certain thing? could be like buying something. It could be taking a vacation in this destination. And when I did that, honestly, I began to realize just how, how mimetic I, I am, right? And, you know, in some sense, at some level, we all are. There's a spectrum. I'm more mimetic in some ways and less mimetic in other ways. But that realization was eye-opening and, you know, it was for me something that I could never unsee after it happened. And so when you got to that holy shit moment, I definitely haven't gone as deep down this rabbit hole as you have. How does it feel when you reach that point where you're kind of looking over the cliff edge and you realize that so much of what you thought was you and your personality and your decisions is exposed to have been not that? Had, is, do you almost have a, a crisis of identity? And how do you rebuild from that when you've had such a, a shift in your mindset? There is, um, I think, looking over the edge and... Um, and a, and a destabilizing feeling and sort of questioning, um, you know, the, the notion of how free we are. Right. And I think freedom is a big idea here in Girard's theory, but the point is not that mimetic desire is, is bad or not that, um, the us being social creatures is a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. You know, we're able to enter into, these intimate relationships with other people um, were able to affect one another. We are social creatures. And the, I, I began to see the positive side of this as well, right? So, you know, if this is true, and if I accept this as true, it means that other people are really important, <laughs> um, really important. My friends are really important. My, the influences on me are really important. Um, growing up, I grew up as an only child, right? So I think I probably had even more of a sense of autonomy and independence um, than most people, right? That that grew up with siblings, and I think you know, you grow up with siblings, you you you're a little just more aware, right, of the way they, that you can be affected by this, like what my big brother wants or something, or he went to school or what he does. Uh, I didn't really have that. Maybe that's why it took me longer. Um, but there was it's there's a, a humility I think that comes with that. And a level of responsibility to choose my models of desire rather than just accept the ones that, are, that the world gives to me, right? I, I can be intentional and I do, I am free to choose those. And so the, regaining a sense of intentionality and responsibility is, was really important um, and actually brought a tremendous sense of peace, right? Like the acceptance actually brought a tremendous sense of peace and, and responsibility. and. Also realizing that, well, not only, you know, do I, am I affected by other people, but I'm probably a model for somebody else and it could be my students. It could be some of my friends. So I just started to, I began to live my life with a heightened degree of awareness and thinking of things on the level of desire. And I had never done that before. You know, I'd, I'd sort of thought about businesses as making things and services and selling them to people. And I never thought of a business as something that actually shapes human desires of their of employees, of customers, of clients. And that recognition was pretty profound for me. I mean, it changed the way that I thought of what being an entrepreneur is. And it, it took on like a lot more gravity for me. It's like, well, I'm not just, I'm not just selling things here. I'm actually like shaping I'm helping to shape what humanity wants. So I, I, I found it ultimately a very liberating thing to discover. And so if we take out perhaps the more obvious examples like Apple, um, as you look around you today, what is a business that stands out to you that is plain as day selling desire in your eyes, but we all think they're selling some utility or some useful thing? Hmm. Great question. Um, I think that... You know, this is a fairly obvious one, but I think that Facebook and all social media companies are fueled by mimetic desire. Um, 
and it's in their best interest to, you know, to, to have that mimetic desire um, accelerate. So, you know, it's not just a platform for exchanging information or ideas. Um, it's a platform for people to, you know, just discover new desires and, and new models. And it's why, um, you know, it's, it's sort of ground zero of desire in our culture. Uh, and it's why companies are moving on to these platforms to, to advertise. Um, it's, I think, the, the driving force behind, you know, sort of the metaverse. Um, it, it's, it's, they're really selling um, not any one particular desire, but desire as such, if that makes sense, right? It's fueled by just this desire as such. Um, so that's one example. But I think if you look behind many of the iconic brands, right? Like, I mean, I, I lived in Vegas for three years. So I think much of Vegas even runs, uh, is selling a desire, right? Is selling a desire for a certain kind of lifestyle for a, a few days. Um, and it's not just, uh, it's not just the promise of making money, uh, winning at a, at a poker table or something like that. It's, it's a desire. And if you look at the way that those, those trips are even advertised, I mean, they're, they're showing people getting married. They're showing like, uh, all kinds of things that have, uh, really nothing to do with, uh, with gambling itself, for instance. Do you think that an understanding of mimetic desire is baked so deeply into uh, the algorithms of apps like Facebook that you and I will perhaps never truly understand the extent of it? Because I draw this this kind of line between mimetic desire and these posts that we see people share every now and then where they're like, oh my God, I needed uh, a new dog toy and Facebook showed me the ad before I even knew. Is that actually just a, a disconnect between there has been a model of desire planted at some point buy an algorithm to show you something and then they will scoop up on the back end and say, well, you can buy it here. Um, or am I, am I connecting dots that perhaps don't exist? I think that's absolutely what's happening. You know, that that's an ex a great example of us like rationalizing after the fact, a desire that was probably planted much earlier and much more subtly over months, maybe even years. And you know, we look at the app and we're like, oh my gosh, I was just talking about this thing and now I'm getting served an ad for it and I bought this. Um, no, it, it's it's a bit more complicated and a bit more subtle than that um, for us to be affected at the level of desire. And I, I, think, I think there's a cumulative effect, right? So I look at the beginning of the pandemic here in the US. Uh, many, many people decided it was a good time to get dogs. Um, you know, it's like, okay, if you see one friend or hear about one friend who gets a dog and, you know, they're sending you to texting you pictures of this cute dog every, every day, um, that may not like cause you to get a dog, but once it happens two, three, four five times, it becomes this thing like you're like, like a FOMO thing, like I'm being left out. And so, I, you know, I think like the idea that we're just served one ad and, and that influences us is a, is a little oversimplistic. So on that topic then, where do we think desires come from? Because as much as I look out into the world, I can't actually find a rhyme or reason of what uh, impacts me when it comes to desires, where desires of friends of mine come from. Because, you know, for example, everybody who I know who likes football wants to be Cristiano Ronaldo, but they also want to dress like their best friend who got that desire from somewhere. Does that make sense? There's this big kind of waterfall of desire that begins somewhere and I can't seem to work out where have we worked out the answer of what is kind of ground zero of desire so I'll give you two two cuts on this um the one one is the theological cut and that's that you know God is the originator of desire okay um and that all desire leads back to God the evolutionary cut on this is that human beings evolved to desire um abstract things Right. So to give you an example, um, if, you know, resources are scarce and, you know, if we all were sort of fighting over the scarce, the same scarce resources, we all desired the same, you know, piece of land or the same food and there's not enough to go around. It just inevitably leads to conflict that results in violence. OK, so at some point, it seems like in the in the process of um, evolutionary development 
hominization, becoming humans, becoming homo sapiens, could be, you know, one, one idea that's been proposed is that we actually evolved to desire differently than, than, than other animals, right? Than the great primates, for instance, where we began, we, we began to develop like symbolic desires and abstract desires, right? I mean, think about the desire for money. What is that? It's a very abstract thing, right? It's very symbolic. The desire for status, the desire for prestige. In a sense, there's an infinite array of abstract desires where there's a finite amount of physical resources. So our desires for these highly abstract things that can change from minute to minute, in some sense, uh, saves us and, and from violence that would result in sort of a more sort of primitive um, conflict over, over resources. So that's, that's definitely one angle on it would be it, it, it actually preserves us and, and allow this seeking that is built into humans. Like our, our wanting is, um, there's something pleasurable about seeking and wanting itself. Like if, if we don't want anything, if we don't desire anything, um, that's like a definition of depression, right? Like people who are depressed are like, like, what do you want to do? They're like, nothing. I just want to sit here on the couch. I want to sleep all day. I don't want anything. So in some sense, I mean, there's some evolutionary basis. It's pleasurable to desire things, to constantly yearn for and seek things. And maybe that's what keeps us going. And the fact that we can, we, we, we seem to be like inventing more and more things to want. <laughs> um, and there's something about that that's profoundly human. Um, obviously, we have to be careful, but there is a sense, there is a sense in which this is the primary differentiator between us and animals is the infinite number of things that we can want. Is there a case to be made that our ability to want and to copy and to find models of desire who are in some way better than us is also evolutionary advantageous because if you were to copy the, uh, the alpha male of your pack who is good at mating and good at continuing their bloodline, you're likely to do more things that lead you towards their success. Is, is, is there a kind of a deeper evolutionary reason as to why we have all now got this wanting gene because those who were better at copying continued and those who didn't didn't so what the last thing that you said so those who are better at copying and imitating may have some advantage over those who don't is a really fascinating idea and i'm just going to think out loud here um is you know gerard wrote a bit about evolution um, not a ton, but a bit. So one way to think about the importance of imitation and mimetic desire for survival is that a group or a tribe um, is bound together by some shared desire, right? Like wanting something at some level, that's the same. Could just be like stability, protection. And you can't really be a part of the tribe without being mimetic in that way, right? It's, it, it's part of the social cohesion in, in a very positive way. And throughout history, those who did not imitate enough or who, were, um, who, who did, weren't sufficiently mimetic to be considered a part of the group were left on the outside and things usually didn't turn out very well for those people, right? Um, if you lose your tribe, you die, right? When you're alone, um, you don't have any protection. And oftentimes, you know, a tribe or a group can turn against you. It happens with animals. It happens in nature. Uh, and it, frankly, it happens with humans too, right? There's something kind of dangerous about being alone. So there's something fundamentally, um, there is some survival basis for um, our mimesis, for our mimetic desire, wanting the same things as other people. Because if we don't want the same things as other people, we're typically labeled a deviant or something, and that uh, can lead to problems. When it comes to imitating um, like an alpha, an alpha or something like that, that's a tricky one because not everybody can be the alpha, <laughs> almost but like by definition, right? So it can lead to internal conflict and, and rivalry. So the trick is imitating the right things and imitating the, the right people 
and non-rivalrous imitation is really the, the key, right? Like the kind of imitation that won't get you killed, that won't get you into fights. And the whole second sort of stage, the second order effect of mimetic desire and Girard's theory is that mimetic desire leads often leads to conflict because we learn to want what other people want, which sort of leads us to view them as rivals. And if we don't realize that this rivalrous part of, of desire is at the core of what it sort of means to desire, we're just constantly led into these love-hate relationships with other people that show us what to want and at the same time sort of you know block the way to, to get it, right? Like we find, see somebody on social media who's, you know, gains a huge following or is famous, we get that desire, but we'll never quite be able to catch up with them. And so you discuss in the book the uh, the interesting kind of curve that happens in as much as it's very obvious when a young child is imitating an adult, right? They, I think you say, they literally pull the same face and we just accept that that's normal. That's how as humans function. And yet as we grow older, we kind of distance ourselves from that imitation. Um, and I was just kind of thinking as you were answering there, is the reason that we try and pretend that our decisions are our own is this deep-rooted kind of avoidance of conflict that you speak of because you can't be in direct competition with somebody if you're not accepting that you are after the same thing as them or is there something else going on do we just want to believe that we're in control i think we have evolved these highly ritualized ways to pretend that we're not mimetic and to avoid conflict so a good example of this would be if there's a job opening at a company and you know you're sitting around with four other people after work at a bar and you all work together and this is a, a this would be a promotion and there's this like really weird sort of game that's often played where you all want it but sort of you don't want to show how much you want it to everybody else um cuz if you all wanted it equally then that might fracture relationships and friendships so there's this really elaborate game that's played in terms of how much you signal, how much you want something. Um, so you have to be careful and sort of like the person who pretends like they want it the least might actually want it the most and vice versa. So um, it's a really weird thing. And this happens in relationships all the time too, by the way. So, you know, people are really coy about their desires. Um, and this is kind of the, the whole idea behind playing hard to get. There's a, there's a mimetic desire aspect to this. Um, because we tend to, we're attracted to things that, um, well, that are, that are difficult to achieve or, or where there's obstacles in our way in some sense, um, to, to those kinds of models of desire. So, you know, a person who's playing hard to get is modeling a desire for themselves um, more than they're modeling a desire for us. And that is, so we're, we're naturally sort of attracted to them because they're sort of modeling the unattainability of this object. So adults do this all the time, and it, we often sort of hide it because we like to present ourselves to the world as knowing exactly what we want, as being in control of what we want, as not wanting anything too much because that's kind of a sign of weakness, right? We want to present ourselves as being self-sufficient. Oh, I have everything that I need. When in reality, we all want something. We all, we all wish that we had something that we don't have, if we're really honest. And, you know, there's just, that comes down to self-awareness. And yes, with children, children tend to be open about what they want. They'll scream it out. They'll cry. They'll tell you, you know, I want this thing that Johnny has. Why don't I have the same toy that he has? They'll beg their parents for it. Um, and they're just open about it. But as we, as we grow into adults, we develop some kind of psychological defense mechanisms against that open display. Is it right to say then, based on your thoughts there, that on this whole spectrum of how willing each of us is to show that actually we are um, desiring things that are external to ourselves that when we go to the right the way to the end of that spectrum we see these people who they they dress in maybe thrifted clothes and they live off the land and they say oh I've, I've checked out from society i'm not involved in that game that's are they doing the same thing are they just looking at different models and actually just basing themselves on you know uh, the, the exact same thing that we're doing just in the opposite way 
That's a great question. Um, and I know people, I know many people that do that. And there, I know some that have done it that uh, re- have regretted it after a short period of time. Um, and they're the ones that are like have made it that post on social media 10 times a day about how great it is to live off the land and the lifestyle. Right. So it's like, maybe there's something else going on there than some kind of um, deep rooted desire to actually do that thing. Right. And I've talked to a friend who did that and, you know, he came clean and was like, yeah, I was really driven by some mimetic desire to, to, for this kind of a lifestyle. And then I realized it's 10 times more work than I thought and I realized that I was doing it for all kinds of these bad social reasons. I do believe, and I do know, people that have adopted certain lifestyles, um, just to stay in the example like that, um, who are very happy and who I think have chosen it for like the right reasons and who seem sort of satisfied Right. And have sort of like they've grounded themselves in the real. Uh, and part of the whole sort of conclusion to my work in my book is that, yeah, there is, there, there are very healthy desires. There are healthy, positive, mimetic desires. And there are things that I call thick desires, right? They're just deep rooted in what it means to be human, right? Things that every, every human sort of wants, right? To be known, right? To be recognized, to be loved. Um, those things are great desires. They're good desires. And what I call thin desires are sort of the highly mimetic ones that change, you know, sometimes on a daily basis. So there are people that uh, find themselves and find that they're able to sink down into some of those sort of thick, less mimetic desires and lead very fulfilling lives. And it's not that they don't want anything, it's that they have sort of exited the game of, of wanting some of the more sort of superficial things that are not actually the things themselves. And that's one of the problems with social media is that like we have an idea of what this thing is or what this lifestyle is that may not be what it is at all. It's just an idea. It's just what's shown to us on social media. Then you get on the farm and you're like, I don't really like picking up pig shit every day. And you you know, you so the you develop a, a a sense of what this desire actually is, rather than just the mimetic version of it. So we'll come onto this more towards the end. But just whilst we're here, I want to ask this: right, is there a model that we can use to almost sanity check our own decision making? Because um, I imagine once we have made, if if all of our decisions are in some way meta, mimetic in their desire, um, as soon as sunk cost fallacy sinks in, it's almost too late to turn back, right? Which is why some of those people who don't like it are still living off the land and thrifting their clothes. Um, can we check before we make a decision in a really kind of logical way whether or not we actually want this thing for the right reasons, or is it far muddier than that? There is a way to test desires. And I, this is really important to test them. Um, and this is what I call just basic discernment, which um, is a little bit different than decision making, right? Decision making, you know, many times you can sort of make decisions like a poker player and, and generally weigh odds. When it comes to desires, it's a little, it's a little trickier than that. Um, because you know we, we're not presented with data where some of these desires lead. lead. But what we can do, um, you know, is adopt some very ancient uh, practices. Um, frankly, you know, they're very spiritual practices and exercises, and understanding sort of like sitting with two desires. Let's say that you've got two competing desires. Um, do I accept this job um, or or the other job? And the two very different industries would result in two completely different life tracks. I just um, talked to somebody this morning who uh, last year was offered a job at a deep mind in London, and then he was offered a job teaching in the philosophy department at a small liberal arts college. Very different jobs, right? He's like, I, I, I see, I have like a desire to do both in different ways. How do I decide between these two things? So what he did is he basically pretended that he had um, accepted the deep mind job in London and he sat with it for a whole week and just imagined himself in that position and paid really careful attention to what it kind of did to him inside, right? Like, did it disturb him? Did it give him peace? Like, you know, he, he kept a really detailed journal 
Then he did the same thing with the other job the next week, and he paid careful attention to that. And it gave him insight into the nature of his desires. And then, you know, he realized some things about himself, like, well, there's something that, you know, I was just sort of, I was attracted to this idea of living in London and being part of this scene and these things that actually had nothing to do with the job whatsoever. And then I realized that I actually do have this deep desire to, to learn and teach philosophy. And, you know, I sort of accepted that part of myself and sort of the decision just became much more clear. I discerned very clearly that I should not take the deep mind job in London. Um, and that was just one little exercise that he did to see what I would call, to, to borrow a term from one of my favorite poets, um, Hopkins, um, his, the inscape, right? There's like an external landscape, but we also have an inscape. And many people don't know their inscapes very well. And he saw this inscape, this essence of each of these two desires by doing that exercise. So that's one of many, I think there are many different tactics, but uh, most of us don't really do that. You know, we don't think of our desires in a way where they can actually be examined a lot more closely. Particularly in a consumerism space then, is part of the issue here that everything is set up these days to not, to not allow us to take pause to have that discernment, right? So for context, I run a marketing agency um, and we're forever optimizing, like, do we remove the navigation from this page so somebody can't go back so they can't, I hate to say, can't consider it, right? Because we want everybody to buy things they actually want. But nonetheless, we're removing blocks of consideration, removing time to pause. Um, do we now just live in a world where there is no time to pause? We have to act now. Um, and that removes our chance to actually discern anything. I think that there's a misalignment of incentives because I, I, you know, as as somebody who's trying to grow a business, um, you know, we're we're we do want to sort of really move people towards a place of, um, you know, you hear like like sort of cause pain, right? Is like one of these terms that you hear, right? Like hit that pain point, right? And then and then get people that, you know, nudge them as quickly as possible to make a decision. And a great example of that are these um, you know, like the timers on websites, right? That that are like showing the countdown. It's like, you know, you have two minutes to add this to your card and to get it. Um and, you know, it of course it always says that, right? But there's this this drive to get, it's just a widget built into the website that does that no matter who's looking at it. Um, I used to use one in my, when I ran an e-commerce company. And when I look back at that, um, it is something that I think is a bit problematic because it is intentionally sort of um, manipulating the way in which people um, are able to well, I mean, we're certainly nudging people, and I think this is an ethical dilemma, right, which opens up. I have a semester-long course next year that's going to be investigating this very question, so I won't be able to do it justice on the podcast. But um, it's, it's something that I think we don't talk enough about in business, and to what extent, I'll just leave it as an open question, to what extent do, do we honor the space that people need to be able to make informed decisions, right? And it's like... Um, you know, I'm in the process of buying a car, right? And it's the difference between the guy who says, well, if you leave, you know, might not be here and you're not going to get this price versus the guy who's like, go home and sleep on it. Like, who do I appreciate more? Obviously, it's the second guy. And I've tried to sort of become the kind of entrepreneur person in business who operates like that um, and applies that to anything that I do, even if I have to sacrifice some short-term boosts. Do you think half the problem here, more generally, even outside of just mimetic desire, is that there is a uh, a massive void between the knowledge on this stuff of the average consumer and then businesses and how this is all plugged in? Um, I say this because when I spoke to, for example, Rory Sutherland, um, he can just drop gem after gem of the reasons why I have done things irrationally that I didn't know why I had done them. Um, and actually, to use your example, buying a car very recently, a few months back, and the sales guy was like, okay, well, if you don't agree to this price now and you leave here, it's going to be gone. But because I knew the game, I was like, okay, well, I'll just go and get, like, I basically just kind of shit tested his sales approach, got the price down, allowed it to continue. It almost seems that because most consumers don't know this stuff, most consumers haven't had conversations like this with you, um, they just fall immediately victim to it. And to use your word, they're almost taken advantage of by big business. So. I, there is a gap, and it's why it, it is important to 
talk about these things and to be informed consumers, um, and not just informed um, at an intellectual level, um, but informed at informed about how we do make decisions. And it's almost like there's a game being played, and some people know the rules of the game, and other people don't. And you know, if you don't sort of know the rules of the game, then you're at a tremendous disadvantage. So, like in your case, in my case, um, you know, looking for a car, um, I can just call the guy's bluff and say, "Yeah, that's that's really nice," but you know, actually, I'm, I am going to go home because I know it'll be this. If I come back here tomorrow morning, it'll be the same exact price. Um, so, there's almost and in, in, even now, even now, um, I almost need to sort of prepare myself to to go to the lot to look at cars because I know how incredibly like seductive it is. Right. So there's, there's like almost a muscle that needs to be trained. So, you know, knowing it at an intellectual level is one thing, but actually developing the, the real kind of muscle that is needed to not do the knee jerk stuff to, to understand why it is that we're, that we want certain things and what we're willing to do to get them is something that just takes time to develop, right? It didn't happen for me overnight. Um, I'm much better at it uh, today than I was 10 years ago, roughly when I first learned about this stuff. But, you know, my wife makes fun of me all the time because I still do things for like highly mimetic reasons. And sometimes I just don't care. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm on that, you know? Um, we're going we're gonna to go, go to this place because I've seen everybody else going to it and it looks phenomenal. And so those kind of impacts when it comes to us as consumers are fairly obvious, right? It's whiter teeth, it's nicer cars, it's designer clothes. When our wants are being engineered on that level, we could argue it's fairly harmless. But how does this play into big politics, right? It seems that certainly here in the UK in the last few years, um, there was a chap, for example, called Dominic Cummings, behavioral scientist who helped the uh, Brexit campaign get over the line uh, and who got Boris Johnson elected, essentially. Um, when people understand in politics how to play with our desires, what impact does that have? Yeah, it, it's... Um I live in Washington, D.C., by the way, so I am totally immersed in D.C. and, and you know, the very political environment. It's one of the only places in the world you can go to that has, like, all the, the political news and TVs and bars, right? We don't have, like, football or soccer. We have politics on. So, you know, I, I, I just see how it plays out. And, and right now, I've seen for the first time that I can remember in the 10 years since I've known about Gerard and mimesis and mimetic desire, um, there are actually um, political operatives who are very well aware of this concept, who have sort of weaponized it and are weaponizing it. And one of the ways that it's weaponized is what I call like a politics of scapegoating, right? Where like the, the easiest way to galvanize a group together is to, you know, to paint somebody else as, as a villain, you know, um, that's certainly happening in the U S it's like, that's the, the, that's what politics essentially is, is, you know, Rene Girard himself once said that, um, the definition of political partisanship is having the scheme, same scapegoat as everybody else, which is the thing that sort of unites. And, um, I think, you know, we need to, just as we need as consumers to develop an awareness of, you know, how uh, we're being sort of marketed to and sold on different things and, and how models of desire are being planted very intentionally all around us in subtle ways to make us desire certain products and services. We have to understand that the same thing is happening in politics, right? So um, to give you a very concrete example, um, and I, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to leave out all, um, if it's okay, I just, I'm going to leave out parties and, and issues. But I literally had a conversation in DC uh, just a few months ago by somebody who said, um, you know, we want um, our party to adopt this as, uh, as an issue that people care about. And we know that in order to do that, we need the right person to embody that value and that person will be a model of desire for everybody else and it's got to be the right person somebody admirable somebody who fits the right demographic and they're going to go and they're going to talk about how much they want to see this change 
And we know that if we plant that model of desire in the right place, and in fact, if we find one model of desire in all of the right cities, and we've identified these 20 cities that are very much on the fringe, it could go either way, we get the right model of desire in in either city, that one person in each of those cities might be enough to swing this election. And this was highly sort of engineered. It was engineered. I mean, these people were like handpicked because they fit certain characteristics. They were given talking points to make, and they were paid money, by the way. So, you know, this is an example of how politics, just like some businesses, can really engineer outcomes by playing with the way that we're sort of mimetic and how we look to other people. Thinking that maybe these people are spontaneously came to desire this political change, when in fact they were sought out, they were sort of uh, brought together as part of a coordinated effort, and it's made to look like it's totally spontaneous when in fact it's very, very much engineered. Is this therefore where the the personality politics comes from? So again, for context today, although this will be massively outdated by the time this episode goes out, um, there are free contenders remaining in the Conservative Party leadership race here in the UK because Boris is resigning, which means that um, one of these free people will be the next UK Prime Minister in a few weeks' time. And if you look at their campaigning, other than maybe we're going to cut some tax, which two of the free seem to be saying... It's purely about politics and it is about like, I'm from this city and I did this as a job and here are all the things that relate me to you. Um, Can we ever turn back out of this now? Or now that this has been manipulated or engineered to use your word, um, is this just the way politics is? I haven't given up on politics completely. Um, You know, I I do think that... um, that it can be transformed. But I think part of the problem is that, uh, you know, the kinds of people that self-select to go into politics in the first place are the kinds of people that want, that want to play the game and are good at playing the game. So, you know, what will it take, right? I sometimes joke with some of my friends, like, you know, maybe the only way um, to have a less toxic political environment here in the U.S. would be, you know, somebody is elected president. and um, the only way that they could be elected president is to play the game really well, probably, and and to sort of you know be, be engaged in this sort of mimetic scapegoating game, and then to have some kind of um, like conversion experience, right? Call it whatever kind of conversion you want to take it as, right? Where they sort of like realize this, and they don't have anything left to prove, they don't have any other office to, and they just like sort of opt out of it completely. <laughs> And actually sort of develops, because I don't know how they would get there in the first place, right, if, if they started out that way. Um, there's, I, I, I think that there's hope for it. Um, you know, I think that, yes, the reason that there's the emphasis on the sort of on the person and on making them feel kindred, whether they are or not, right? I mean, like Trump, like somehow, like convinced, you know, many Americans that he was like, really like like them in some way, right? That is part of the mimetic desire game. Um, and, you know, that's, that's why we do it. There's something important, I think, to caring about who the person is, right? I mean, what's the alternative? Like we only talk about ideas and it's like, well, you know, who cares who the person is? Um, but like whatever happened to actually caring about um, like in integrity. It's almost as if, and this is, I think, the biggest problem, it's almost as if like we've um, thrown in the towel and accepted the fact that the game is being played and not held our politicians to a higher standard. And so in all of this, in bringing together the conversation so far and the importance of having an understanding of mimetic desire, um, they say that acceptance is the first step in recovery, right? And whilst I'm not suggesting that any of us can opt out of our desires being mimetic, um, am I correct in saying that being merely aware of this concept on a very foundational level is enough to help us make better decisions? It is the most important and the first step is becoming aware. Um, and, you know, it's a constant vigilance though. It's, it's you know, being aware um, for a short period of time is one thing, but um, sort of allowing it to sort of seep down into into our bones and just become like more of a habit is another thing. Um, 
you know, I've learned about many things that, you know, are with me for a couple of weeks and then I totally forget about them. And it's really easy to do. So the awareness is important, but almost developing practices to remain aware is equally important. And then where the rubber really hits the road is, well, how does this affect my actual decision-making and the way that I live my life? Um, am, I, am I merely sort of like talking about this or, you know, are there like real concrete behaviors that are changing? And you know, that's, I, I, I try to make this as practical as possible. So like, as I, as I teach a, a whole semester on this, um, part of the process is like identifying what are, what are our mimetic thin desires and naming them and naming the models that are responsible for them, whether they come from social media, whether they come from inside of our family or our friends, whatever. Um, putting names to things is incredibly important. And, and then getting to, getting to understand like well, what, what, is, what are the kinds of desires that seem to, to have some continuity to them. That seem to there seems to be some more substance there. What are those? Like, can we put a name to those? What what is it? And doing that process, um, and each everybody has their own way. Some people like to you know keep a daily journal. That is really important to the process of seeing like how this actually plays out in our life. So that when a decision comes, whether it's a career change, um, a relationship, uh, something like that, something important. You know, we have some some history, right? We we get to know ourselves better because the most important awareness is self awareness. Um, you know, which is which is always the first step in any kind of um, yeah. Like recovery is not is not the best word because there's nothing bad about being you know our desires and, and our mimetic desire, but at least that's the first step in being able to more intentionally choose our models. Amazing. I think that's a really good place to finish. Um, Luke Burgess, thanks so much. I'm going to make sure that wanting the power of mimetic desire in everyday life is linked in the show notes below. If people want to go elsewhere in the meantime, whilst they're waiting for their book to arrive, where can they head to find your stuff? Uh, they can find me at lukeburgess.com. Um, and I write a, a sub stack called anti-mimetic for all of the stuff that I couldn't fit in the book. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Sean. It was great.